Now let's again make sure this uh, is making common sense. Um, when we were looking at this process, uh, the, um, basically here we have snow in contact with um, the steam, and as a result, the steam is condensing. Well, does this seem like a reversible or irreversible process? Um. And steam condenses in contact with snow. Reversible? Now, in fact, well, what's happening here is we're putting the steam in contact with the snow, and as a result, it's turning into a liquid. Uh -huh. Well, we would not expect it then to suddenly boil again. Yeah. Right? When you, um, so we can expect that steam in contact with snow is going to move in this direction. But once it gets to this direction, it's not going to suddenly move in the opposite direction. And it's not like we're on the verge of doing that either. Yeah. Um, steam in contact with snow is going to move to the left. Yeah. But then water in contact with snow is not going to move to the right. So this is not a reversible process because we're not uh, because it would not make sense to imagine this process suddenly reversing itself. Yeah. Okay. Um, so would we expect entropy to increase or um, uh, the entropy of the universe to go up, down, or stay constant here for a irreversible process? What does the second law of thermodynamics tell us about that? That it would go up. That's right. And is that what our results were? Yeah. yeah. It's just a little confusing. I guess just kind of counterintuitive because you think that like the system, everything in the system is like, I guess the snow is remaining colder, but the steam is going towards more order. It's true that the steam is becoming more ordered, mm -hmm. but the snow is becoming less ordered. And yeah. in fact, notice that the increase of disorder of the snow more than counterbalances the uh, decrease of disorder of the steam. Mm -hmm. Now, you might have thought that the snow wasn't having any, uh, wasn't having any changes because we're saying that the temperature is hardly going to change. Mm -hmm. But that's just because there's so much snow. Yeah. Because there's so much snow, the temperature is hardly going to change. But even a minute change in the temperature would have a big impact on the entropy. Right. Because there's a huge amount. In fact, we're kind of approximating it as an infinite amount of snow. Yeah. So even an infinitesimal increase in the temperature would have a very big increase of the entropy. Right. OK. So um, the, uh, the steam is becoming more ordered. Um, and the snow is becoming uh, less ordered, and that more than counterbalances that. So the entropy of the universe did go up, mm -hmm. which is what it would have to be for an irreversible process. That's one thing that the instructor wants you to notice here. The whole point of this problem is this is a demonstration of the second law of thermodynamics. It's demonstrating that for this irreversible process, entropy actually went up. And now we can see why that has to be the case. Um, now, at first, you might think that the entropy can't change because all the heat that is lost by the steam is gained by the snow. So you might think they were going to cancel each other out. If the heat that's lost by the steam is gained by the snow, why don't they cancel each other out? But that's the role of the temperature that we talked about earlier. The um, steam is losing heat, but it's starting from a high temperature, so it doesn't have much impact. It has so much disorder that a small change makes almost no difference. The snow is gaining the same amount of heat, but it's starting at a much lower temperature. It's starting at much more order, so it's going to have much bigger impact that the heat exchange is going to have a much bigger impact on the snow than on the steam. So in a way, just looking at this, this is almost a, a proof of the second law of thermodynamics. It's a, anyway, it's a proof that any time heat goes from something hotter to something colder, the entropy has to go up. Mm -hmm. Because the effect of the entropy change on the hot uh, substance is going to be more than counterbalanced by the effect of the entropy change on the cooler substance. So we're kind of proving a special case of uh, the law of thermodynamics here. Mm -hmm. Now, um, just one more subtlety that the instructor might expect you to think about. Remember that the way we justified using these formulas is we imagined that we could have done this using a reversible process. That might be why you got confused about whether this re was reversible or irreversible. The actual process in the problem was irreversible because the heat was going out of the steam and into the snow. But to justify using these formulas, we imagined a reversible process. For ima we imagined that the heat is going out of the steam and into water that's at the same temperature. Mm -hmm. And we imagined that um, the snow was gaining the heat from uh, other snow that was almost at that same temperature. So we imagined a reversible process. And in that case, the entropy of the universe wouldn't have changed, because the steam would be losing heat to um, something that's at the same temperature as it. Mm -hmm. Well, if two things are at the same temperature and they have the same heat exchange, then the two entropy changes are going to balance. And again, for the snow, the snow would be gaining heat from other snow that's at almost, at almost the same temperature. Yeah. So they would have heat exchanges of equal magnitudes that have the same temperature, so those two things would cancel each other out. 
So we've kind of sketched out the proof for why in a reversible process, the delta S of the universe doesn't change. Okay. That's, that's a little bit subtle, but the instructor definitely wants you to notice that this is an irreversible process, so the entropy went up. Okay, so, um, so now we've seen how to relate entropy changes to our heating curve, and that's something you're likely to see on the exam. Entropy changes and the heating curve. We sh showed how to deal with the case of a phase change. This particular problem didn't deal with a temperature change. So you can't, imagine, you can't assume that every problem is about temperature change. But in the handout, we also went over the formulas for temperature change as well. And then we added one more thing. Any heat that is absorbed or released by one part of the system is balanced by the heat absorbed and released someplace else. So the heat that the steam was losing was being gained by the snow. That was the one thing that held us up. And we saw the importance of putting subscripts on everybody. Say whose delta S you're talking about and whose Q you're talking about. Uh, in this case, the universe was the steam plus the snow. Now, of course, in real life, there's more to the universe than just the steam and the snow, but we're approximating by saying that the only things that are being affected by this problem are the steam and the snow, so those take up the whole universe. Okay. All right, so. Let's go back and think again about isothermal processes, like we talked about last time. Let's draw what the PV curve would look like for an isothermal expansion. Now we've already talked about how to find delta U and work and Q for isothermal processes. So let's think about how would we figure out the entropy change. Well, what, what formula seems to be applicable to figuring out the entropy change for an isothermal expansion? Um, delta S equals Q over T. That's right, yeah. Well, what, what's one thing that tells us that it, we're allowed to use that formula here? And how do we know it's constant temperature? Because that's the definition of isothermal. Mm -hmm. All right. So that's something we didn't talk about for isothermal processes the last time because we haven't dealt with entropy yet. Mm -hmm. But we need to make a note that it's relatively straightforward to find the entropy change for an isothermal process because we can just use our constant temperature formula. All right. Now there's one complication here. Do you remember, is this formula for reversible or irreversible processes? Reverse. Yeah, reversible only. Well, last time when we talked about our special processes, did we say they were reversible or irreversible? Um, that one we didn't talk about very much. Uh -huh. But those, all those processes we talked about last time, uh, isothermal. Reversible, I guess? Yeah, that's right. It's taken for granted that all of these are, I'm sorry, that all of them are reversible. So this is for yeah, all the processes here on this side of the handout, these are all reversible ideal gas processes. You, you can see that because remember, uh, we, we only talked about this very briefly last time, but it turns out you can, it only makes sense to draw PV curves for reversible processes. It doesn't make sense to draw PV curves for irreversible processes because the pressure and the volume can be different in different parts of the gas. Basically, in an irreversible process, there can be turbulence inside of the gas because it's not in equilibrium, and so it can have multiple pressures. It can have multiple pressures, and maybe even, in a sense, multiple volumes. So it doesn't make sense to say there's a well-defined PV curve. Okay. Another way to see that is when we drew those graphs, we were always saying um, we never said that you can only go in one direction. We said we, we might have focused on going this way, but then a second later we might have focused on going this way. Yeah. We didn't say that there's any just one direction we can move in. 
So that's something that's not laid out as clearly as it should be in the course. But when people talk about all those processes that we talked about last week, it's taking for granted that they're reversible. We're taking that for granted when we draw the PV curve in the first place. All right, well, that means that we're justified in using this formula, because this is a formula for reversible processes. Uh, how would you figure out what Q is? Well, if you look at the handout, we know that there's a formula for finding Q for isothermal processes. That's N C sub V delta T. I think, uh, yeah, the heat exchanged in, uh, no, 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 I'm getting confused. Mm. Oh, yeah, so I remember how we do it. For an isothermal process, delta U is zero. So the heat is the work that's done by the system. Oh, yeah. But there's a formula to figure out the work that's done by the system. Which is NRT LN the That's right. So we have a good way to deal with entropy for isothermal processes. Mm -hmm. uh, we can figure out the work, which tells us the heat, and then we can plug that into our constant temperature formula to find delta S.